The Shin Show. Today's guest, director J.L. Park. All right, next yeah. question yeah. from the fans Move is, um, the whole team must have gone through a long research process before reaching the members. How did you determine which topics will be covered as not uh, so as not to fall back on something that had already been covered by the members in songs or interviews? Well, it wasn't about, I mean, that's why we didn't want to do the behind the scenes in a concert uh, style of documentary because we didn't want to do the same thing or like rehash what's, what's been done before. In the same way, when it comes to their stories in their past, we didn't like worry about repeating what fans already knew. What we ca cared about more is even if we delve into some aspects of their personal history that fans were already aware of, our goal was to get deeper into that or add details that they didn't know. Uh, you know, prior, and I think many of the members were excited sharing more details of uh, of uh, their past because you know some of them um, wanted to have, get a chance to clarify or dispel like rumors, you know. So I think um, uh, sharing details about their past and uh, getting more detail about it and getting more in depth about it was the goal. Uh, this question is, uh, did you try to cater to fans' expectation or preference? Uh, like putting something the fans might like or notice, placing yourself in their point of view? Or did you focus on the general audience or your own ideals? Wow, were these questions ever, are good. Yeah. Uh, were you ever worried about fans' response? And do you think non-fans will still be able to enjoy the series? Wow, that's a whoever. Yeah, I really like this question. It's, it's, it's layered questions, but I, I think... That's you, a really good question. Yeah. Well, it changed throughout because in the beginning, it was about, you know, I want to make a documentary. And this is what I try to convince Mystic and Disney. You know, I said, let's try to make a good documentary that all, doesn't only cater to the fans, but caters to the general audience. That's how we started, that we want to make a documentary that's entertaining. So that's why we didn't want to do the, you know, the the conventional concert documentary because it's a concert documentary could turn out to, to be too much of like, like promotional or behind the scenes type mm -hmm. of thing. It's still entertaining, you know, but what we wanted to do was tell stories about these members and have new fans, maybe <clears throat> cater to a general audience that doesn't, isn't a fan of K-pop. They can watch this documentary and still be entertained. But the thing was, um, I realized that if we cater to the, to, to NCT 127 fans, like to the utmost degree, it would end up being, uh, a documentary that caters to the general audience anyway because i think what the fans want is uh something special it's neo culture technology right so something new and something that only nct 127 can do you know uh show elements of of their personality and their talent that um maybe the general audience is is unaware of so in the end we realize the answer is the same catering it to to the fans is actually catering to the uh, general audience and i think the the reception so far has proven that because the easter eggs a lot of people a lot of fans talk about it like the the details that we put in it i'm pretty sure fans know that we really care you know are there any easter eggs you missed that you can share with us i mean that's why it's called easter eggs you gotta find them. you gotta find them that's not uh Mm -hmm. but i'll say this uh i did check online if to see if people were finding easter eggs there's so much left over. Mm. And there are some Easter eggs if people found it would go viral. Mm. Um, if someone found and had the receipt, it would go viral. And I was surprised that people didn't find it yet. Actually, that's a lie. Someone did find it, but uh, people weren't taking it seriously. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, but, I mean, there's so many Easter eggs, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, there are so many stories that we put in there. Unfortunately, were cut out. There's yeah, something yeah. that we just can't control. Yeah. But I think we were so excited about the Easter eggs yeah. because it's another thing that the fans can go back and watch and learn, like what we were trying to do and what yeah. message we're trying to send. The amount of Easter eggs are that are in there. Um, well, of course, there's the hidden uh, light stick in every episode. Mm. You know, in the animation and, and the performances. That's easy, but. The other ones that people are noticing is like in Utah's performance on the train, mm -hmm. all those ads are, they weren't there. All of those were created by us. So that, I guess I'm revealing one Easter egg, which is yeah. pay attention to the ads on the subway. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, especially during the dance, because 
there's a whole bunch of ads there. I you think can... because it is quite a bit of maybe it's really hard for them to read what it is, but I think it's there. Yeah, it's there. We 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 took time to make those details. They you know put 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 the details there. So some fans are saying, oh, it would have been great if it, they had this in there. Maybe we do have it in there, just to haven't found it yet. If, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, the fan question is, I want to ask, this is a story about a past life that is private and has never even been told by the members themselves. So how did the director and members agree to tell the story in the first place? And how do the members feel of after knowing this? Uh, most importantly, what we did was we had these off, off record interviews after researching the members for about two months. I met with the uh, like all nine members individually along with my head writer, uh, Nyan Lee. At the end of the day, it was an organic process where we discussed it. And um, I think most of the members were very excited about the stories that they were going to share. But again, after the documentary was over, the, the reception was good. I mean, because, uh, you know, we're all on set together. All the members know what stories they shared. So it wasn't it wasn't a surprise for them. I think the surprise was that uh, we put in so much with the creative details like the animation, the performance, and those details, uh, you know, uh, many members uh, complimented us and 99% uh, of the words, even the narration in the documentary is the exact things that the members, them they themselves said. We did additional dialogue recording, you know, for better sound sometimes, but the main job of the writers and me was to, um, to edit it, you know, and uh, put a like a cohesive thread, a concept to it. But it was an organic process initially. The Shin Show. So in other documentaries, for example, do you think, do they usually do this? This is my personal question, but because of your answer yeah. is like what you just said from pre like uh, recordings by rephrasing it again, do they usually do that in documentaries or is this something that we had to do because of the time constraint that we had? I guess this is a kind of a unique K-pop documentary, but when it comes to just the documentaries, like there's so many amazing documentaries out there. I think we were definitely influenced by a couple, like uh, The Art of Killing, completely different type of documentary, Khan Film Festival, like, like, you know, like festival circuit award-winning documentary, but The Art of Killing had, um, uh, you know, their subject matter reenact uh, their experiences. And I think uh, I was influenced by that. And there was also um, Center Stage um, and Center Stage with Maggie Chung. And basically she was, you know, playing this fictitious role. But in the middle of the film, the, the director would interview uh, the actor. And I think we were influenced by that. So um, I think uh, if you want to talk about influences, those two documentaries... Uh, we were influenced by heavily, but um, I think the important thing is like, I think Jayon said it best, Chan said there's the public image and then there's a private life image. You know, it's not like one is real and one is fake and one is real and one is fake. Both are them and Jayon said it so well. So I think this con this concept, this structure we had of the fi fiction element with animation and the performances and having them interviewed, you know, raw interviews and combining the two, I think, um, fit in so perfectly because it's almost like we have the the public image and the private life image and we're trying to find a harmony between the two and I, I think that was one of the themes and substance over style so the form followed the function and I'm pretty happy with that. Which documentary authors both storytelling and technical cinematography wise did you take inspiration from this project and why did you choose that for NCT 127 specifically? Uh, okay so I guess besides uh, Center Stage and The Art of Killing um, I mean, it's almost like every documentary copies Era Morse these days, you know, like, um, even I think, uh, you know, I saw the Black Pink documentary and it was, what we, what we used was, uh, it was called the uh, Interatron and the Interatron method is basically you have a camera, uh, set up in front of the, uh, the interview subject and they get, if you, they can't stare into a camera and talk, right. Cause it's kind of, uh, you know, like, Unnatural. It's not, yeah, it's not personal. So what happened, uh, the interatron that was invented by Errol Morris is you look, stare at a monitor and you see the interviewee's face, you know, the interviewer's face, I mean, rather. So the members, like, like I, I think in the beginning of the documentary, you see Johnny laughing, like, ha ha ha, right? right? In the very beginning, the, like episode one, is because as soon as he sat down, what he did was 
he saw my face, my gigantic face in, <laughs> in, in on his monitor. And he's like, oh, I'm just staring at a monitor. And the thing is that monitor that shows my face behind the monitor, inside the monitor is a camera that's recording Johnny. So all the nine members were actually staring at my face, like talking and personally. But the thing was, uh, you know, at the same time, that monitor that's showing my face behind it is the camera. So we like this, uh, we like this setup because it's almost like the members are talking to the fans or the audience. And, you know, it's almost like talking like this and it's very personal, you know, so uh, we, we, we used Errol Morris's and Terratron setup. So when they're telling a story, it's very personal. It's almost like they're talking to the audience directly. Yeah. Also, uh, the Interatron definitely like we uh, I got to give props to James, you obviously, um, and also my writing team and uh, Nan Lee. What we did really well because of the time constraints is uh, the idea to do the off the record interviews prior to shooting any documentary to talk to them and discuss what we're going to interview them about, you know, and the stories that they're going to share. And because we uh, before sh actually shooting and we had this personal relationship with them, they were very comfortable because sometimes like, you know, there's a public image and a private image, a, a private life image. Sometimes you don't know if you're going to talk to them like a friend or you're going to talk to them like they're like a reporter from a NME, you know, you don't know. So because we had set it up prior in the off the record interviews, when they were on set with like, you know, like dozens of people there, uh, they were still be, they were still able to be very comfortable. And the Interatron setup really helped as well. The Shin Show. Okay, the next fan question is, as this documentary differs from the typical K-pop documentary, how did you decide on the format of it? Um, was it inspired by the member's story? Or was it something that you knew you wanted to explore from the beginning? Well, I think, like I said earlier, like you don't want to um, uh, decide on what the documentary is before you even shoot anything. Like, of course, you're going to have a general plan, but um, if you want, like, if you go into a documentary saying, "Oh, I'm going to do this type of documentary," then you're doing a disservice to your subjects, and also your subject matter. So um, initially, like, it was a blank slate, you know, that throughout the process, you want to be creative later. But after the stories, it was after hearing their stories that we want to put put in, like, animation and uh, theater and stuff like that. I mean, of course, in the back of my mind, I thought if they're going to tell these compelling, like, stories, it would be great to put in a variety of different mediums. So, yeah, I had it in the back of my head, but it wasn't decided, you know. It's not like... Oh, I ha I'm going to put animation and all this stuff. So please tell an interesting story to cater to my ideas. No, it's, it should be the opposite. Uh, I want to talk about something about the animation. Um, can you tell me about like, you know, what was what you found difficult or, you know, are you glad that you did this? Well, every film, you know, has a new set, new set of problems or repeat problems. But uh, with animation, we def definitely because every story is different. We wanted to find an animator that would be the best at representing that that member and th that story. And I think, um, you know, uh, my directing team did an amazing job, including you and I on searching for the proper animators to tell that particular story. So yeah, I think initially after we had all the stories together, finding the nine animators, we were excited about that. It was an arduous process, but luckily all nine animators were extremely talented. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we were worried about time and things like that. But yeah. I, I it just, I mean, I mean, I didn't really have too much to do with animation, to be honest. It was you and uh, Nayeon Lee. I think you guys did a phenomenal job. Yeah, I mean, the, the animators did a phenomenal job. But the thing is, uh, I just want to say, I want to thank the animators because they had, normally you need three, three times a longer period to work on what we did. They had, a, they had like months to work on this. And it, it's like, uh, usually it's impossible, but I think uh, they, they work 24 seven to complete the animation. And also, you know, when the editing notes come in, it's really yeah. difficult. So, so, you know, like when the powers that be want to take certain things out, you know, animation, it takes like, like hundreds of hours to do just like a couple of shots and all of a sudden they have to, to change it. But everyone was so nice, you know? Mm, yeah, I think it was, it was stressful for everyone, but I think, you know, the animator, direct animators, they did a phenomenal job. But for you as director, I think you guys did a great job as well. Yeah. All right, your first impression about the members. My first impression? Yeah. 
my first impression was that there was a lot more honest than that I than I had um, predicted they would be. That like all of them were extremely honest. So that was my uh, general impression that they were very honest and they were very thoughtful too. Uh, but at the same time, I think they were able to be honest and thoughtful because you know most of the members said when we we're asking these off the record interviews, no one had ever asked them that. You know. Yeah, because it's Korean culture. You, you don't, you know, you don't ask them like very personal questions. So, um, yeah, that was my uh, initial uh, impression. They were thoughtful and honest. I, I like that story you told me. You know, because we had around two hours each for oh, each. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a. So what happens when you're doing hours of interviews? Your biological clock sort of uh, <laughs> like you start matching up. So. I just realized while I, I was, I, by the time I finished interviews, I realized that I've been using the bathroom with every single member because <laughs> like we're at SM and there's like the third or third or second floor. And it's like a, there's a long corridor to the bathroom and like there was the head writer there and there's me and we're drinking. Cause like, you know, you know you're, you're a guest dry. So we're drinking uh, water and after like every hour, we, we, you know, you got to pee. So like, and I'm going to the bathroom. I realize like, I am peeing next to every member of NCT 127. And at a certain point, I was just like going to the course. Should I just wait outside after, like give them privacy, like have them pee first and then go in? That would be really awkward too, because you, you want to, you know, know them in a person, like a human to human level. So I started walking very slowly sometimes, like, you know, because like, there'll be like a member that walks faster. So I walk slowly. <laughs> and there was like, one interview where I just didn't pee. Like, but the thing is, but, uh, um, yeah, but then you know there was a after after two hours. Yeah, I remember like uh, just quietly peeing there, you know, and then thinking like, should I say something? Because it's so quiet in the room. Because like that that's like the private uh, floor. So I remember like, and it's like it's, it was weird. It's not like it's not a it's like three stalls. So it's like once I accidentally used the middle stall. So oh, I'm like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> but I, I, I like I because I, I went in first. I, I don't know why I did. Maybe I was like, uh, but yeah, the, I think that was like the the interesting experience where I'm paying next to them. The Shin Show. During the interviews, yeah. who were the most uh, like uh, mood makers? Who were you know kind of. You know, while they were you were filming them. Oh, like you mean like in the group interviews? Or group interviews, or as individually, like you know. Everyone, they were like this, like fine-tuned machine. Where like I remember, like there's so many stories, but okay, all right. Of course, Johnny's one of the funniest. Like I think Johnny's the funniest to me personally. Like, I remember, like there's a sequence where there's like the you know like where they're all set it to get seated together, and they rotate every time the uh, you know new member doesn't like, participates in the interview. I remember like. When we were choreographing that, my my second AD, uh, you know, Chiu, who did a phenomenal job with the Easter eggs, by the way, mm. uh, she would time it because it's like the choreography. So she'll be like one, two, three, four, and then Johnny, like for every take, he, what he started doing was like, uh, like let's say do the one, one, five, two, seven, <laughs> sixteen. 19 like that's what johnny would do and he would do consistently and like uh you know try to like make people laugh and, yeah you know we did laugh and uh so it was like a very it wasn't like this like serious vibe like uh so johnny was joking like that and then there's one scripted line you know scripted line where taeyong looks back and he says is it my turn and then he starts walking and we did one take of it and then taeyong's usually really professional he's serious about his job but everyone started making fun of him so it's like, like, he, he, like I don't know, it's a headshot, but like every member was like, like every after the take, they would look at the camera and they would look at Taeyong and say, is it my turn? <laughs> is it my turn? Is it my turn? So Taeyong, like, in the middle, was like, he was like, stop it, you know? Like, yeah. so, yeah, like, it was like a humorous vibe, you know? Like, it, it was, uh, uh, obviously, um, they were very tired because their life is nonstop work, you know? It's like the K-pop system. But, uh, you know, most of the time they were humorous. I remember Jay, like, and there's jo Johnny was like a, like a comedian funny. And then Cheon, who was like this awkward, weird funny. Yeah. I was, I was looking at the, 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 the behind the scenes footage and I noticed Cheon go over to somebody and like, like put his head like over their shoulders and the, the, the person doesn't even know. And all of a sudden Cheon's like looking at him and he's like, 
He's, Jayon starts running backwards, running like behind the set, and he just plops down and just like lays on the ground. And I'm just <laughs> like, what is he doing? You know. <laughs> So like I mean I think uh, like all 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 line members are hilarious like mm. even Ch of course Chan was hilarious but Hei Chan's funny Mark is funny his own way like he's funny because un un unintentionally funny mm. um, yeah but all line members I mean they've worked together for seven years together now eight so I think and there's they're part of the trainee system as well like yeah they're all hilarious you know yeah um, I think when I was interviewing them in L A in New York I think I felt definitely. Uh, I think there was a moment with Cheon, especially we were talking about you know his trainee days and stuff like that. And I asked him if he want to ever go back to it, but like it was you know because it's such a it's such a stressful time for any trainees. And I remember he just started breaking out laughing, and we were just laughing for two minutes. We just couldn't continue the interview. But instead, why were you guys laughing? <laughs> well, what is the, what what is the meaning behind the laughter? Uh, she just. Well, he, I mean, the question was, I don't know if this will happen, <laughs> it, it, it will be edited this out, but like I said, do you want to ever go back to the trainee days? And he said that he would like to train, uh, the trainee days, he, he can go back. He said he really enjoyed it. He learned a lot and everything like that. Yeah, Jayan had, uh, surprisingly, Jayan had one of the most, um, he remembers his trainee days the, uh, uh, in a fun way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because he, he learned singing and dancing. Yeah. But I think... But he said that his first first two years, he said that it was completely changing his whole entire lifestyle because he had his he had his private life and he had his trainee's life. But like now when he debuted, he didn't have a private life. They, obviously, yeah. for any idols, not just him, any idol, yeah. any celebrity would have done this. Uh, would have said the same thing. And I just said, "Would you go back?" And he said, "I would go back to the trainee, but he, he just doesn't want to go through that first two years yeah. because it was an adjusting time for him. And as it is, as that, he just broke out in laughter and. He just just said I never want to go yeah, back to that. Yeah, even in the documentary, I mean, it does indirectly address that slump period. Yeah, know? yeah. I think everybody had their tough times in different times in their career. Yeah, I mean, it's like I think it's just you know growing pains of uh, becoming an idol. You know, like you're in the nascent stages of your career. You know, mm -mm -mm. out of all the childhood stories for from all the members, what was your favorite? Oh my it's god! It's such a hard question because I thought about this question so many times. But like I can choose one. If I had to choose one, I mean, oh man, that's because it's it's. I'm not even joking. Like I mean, all nine stories. Like it's like so. Like there's such variety. But if I had to choose, would be the story of Chawu, who uh, Chawu's mother had bought him these soccer shoes and. Uh, you know, and Chongu, he won, he bought it himself online, but the shoes were a bit, uh, slightly big, you know, and uh, he was in soccer practice. And the thing is, like soccer in Korea, like usually soccer moms are very wealthy, but like mentioned in the documentary, Chongu's mom wasn't that, you know, wealthy. She had visited him along with the other parents in soccer practice, and she teared up because she noticed that the, the shoes are so big and Chongu didn't bother to mention it. And so there's stories like that. Um, but this is not really off the record, so we can mm. disclose this information. It's just that got cut from the film. And stories like that or like Chawo where the mom, um, I remember one fan said this, uh, fan said like, it's almost that this documentary is, um, secretly it's a documentary about amazing mothers. And I completely agree. That's what we like, said. Like the writing team and you, we, we were like, this documentary is about amazing mothers, you know, and the amazing mother story again with Chao was um, because Chao's mom wanted to instill in him, like inspire him, you know, like he wasn't the best student. He was still searching for, you know, his passion in life in middle school. And what Chao's mom did for Chao and her daughter is there was this musical uh, Notre, Notre Dame de Paris and Notre Dame de Paris. I, I, I know the current pronunciation of a French Howdy. title. Yeah, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, so basically, um, the tickets were extremely expensive, you know, in the hundreds, hundreds of dollars category. So she paid for the tickets, had her children watch it while she waited outside, you know, and it's the, yeah, the stories like that get me because I mean, yeah, and it's getting uh, me even now. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, like that. Uh, she waited outside for Chawu and Chawu's sister to, to watch it. And then afterwards, they met outside and. Now, stories like that, I think, you know, I guess the cut 
out stories are the ones I like the most. And I just want to say, add like, there's all these stories, there are aspects of it, like Taehyung's story is a lot more, uh, a lot more serious. We had to, you know, tr you know, yeah. Disneyfy it. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, Taehyung's story, if you, like the, if you know the, like the adult version of Taehyung or Hitan's hey story, you can't listen to it without crying. I mean, my head writer, like, especially with Taehyung, like, of course he's Peter Pan, you know, because what he had to endure in high school, oh my God, like, uh, is has made him this tough uh, person, you know, and tough leader. Taehyung, in, the, in his training days, he had a difficult time because he, funnily enough, he was a bad dancer. Exactly. Like when, when I heard that, oh, like I was like, like no he, way. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah. every member, I mean, Tay, Tay's uh, story. Oh my God. Like ah. one day, maybe 10 years later, direct this cut, direct this cut. I just want to say, uh, I, I had to send individual texts to each member apologizing about whatever aspects of their story that got cut. The problem wasn't disclosing too much information the problem was what we've cut mm -hmm. you know and but like i said it's about it, it's this is not a new thing it's the film industry and mm -hmm. usually you don't get final cuts so and you, you have to appease uh the distributor you have to appease also the company that's representing uh as one to seven along with you know the producers and you know mystic so i think it's not new to us it's 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 for every every yeah. project so yeah. I, filmmaking yeah. is the art of compromise mm -hmm. and just that I would have loved it if I had to compromise less. <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, like yeah. I mean, I'm leaving out um so much. But Hechan's story, Utah's story, the Nishrani days, like whole animation sequences got cut. Mm -hmm. Uh, Teddy's story, the the most beautiful part. Oh my God, where it connects it with Utah because there's butterflies even in Teddy's story. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh my God, that. Oh. <sighs> oh man. Oh and. Toyong, oh my god, I'm so uh, upset about Toyong's story. I mean, there's but, an, but he mentioned it on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, and so. that part, like the, the, when he was like on Bubble, like he was talking about why he chose to, uh, you know, share this difficult part about difficult um, history of his life. He shared it on Bubble, but he had actually said it in the documentary, mm -hmm. and it was so important for us to include it. But it had inev inevitably it got cut, but. Um, you know, so makes it harder compromise. Exactly. Um, so uh, the fan question was: In the recent interview, you spoke about how documentary changed your initial perception of K-pop idol is not humble. Um, was there a specific moment with NCT One Two Seven time uh, or time during the filming process that sparked this shift? I mean, as a documentarian, like when they say they're very candid on camera, you're excited. But it was from the get go. Like every member was so honest. In fact, like. Utah was almost too honest that, <laughs> I, I mean, I was excited that he was dishonest. You know, at that point, I didn't know how much would get edited out. But I knew even some of the stuff that Utah said, I was like, okay, I can't include his documents. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, so that's how I know, knew um, the fact that they were uh, speaking to me like a human being, mm -hmm. you know, and not like a superstar, you know. I think even the fans watching the documentary would feel that way. I mean, after uh, seeing, watching the history of their past, that they, a lot of them have humble beginnings, you mm -hmm. know, so... It's not nepotism, you know. They got here uh, based on hard work and dedication. Every single member, you know. The Shin Show.